Good morning and welcome to today's workshop on designing an accessible course syllabus. The course syllabus is an essential component of your course and should be precise, clear, and accessible. A syllabus is often the first means of communication between you and all of your students. So a well-designed accessible syllabus is very important um, and it follows ideally the universal design principles for learning and would benefit all students. So in this workshop, we're going to talk about some tools and strategies to help you create a well-organized and accessible course syllabus. And I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, or SUB, at NIU. I'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, feel free to post that to the chat thread, and I'll address them as they come up. So let's get to know all of you in the text chat to tell us what your department or division is, what's your role, explain what you're hoping to get out of this workshop, and I'll, I'll give you a minute to do that. Great, so we've got some responses coming in and we've got some representation from business and from CIDL and music. We also have biological sciences represented here, orientation and first year programs. We also have political science and environmental studies. Welcome. All right, and as the rest of you are entering information in the chat, um, also let's do a little bit of a check-in. Um, we also have nursing here today, great. Um, so how are you today? How are you doing? Um, I like to do this with my students in our online sessions. Um, so have them share an emoji, something easy that they can do. They don't have to expand on it, but it just kind of gives me a sense um, of the, the mood of the room, I guess you could say. So I will participate as well. A little chilly. I turned off my space heater because it's very noisy in my office. And my office is very cold. One wall is entirely windows, so that doesn't help. Although I do enjoy the, the sunlight. All right, so we've got a range, a range of uh, of emojis here. Excellent. All right, so let's talk about our workshop objectives. Um, in this workshop, we're gonna talk about some practical strategies for how to identify the benefits of universal design learning, um, to distinguish between non-accessible and accessible elements of a syllabus, to use basic tools and strategies to create an accessible syllabus, and assess the syllabus experience for students. So for example, navigation, the tone, uh, inclusion, 
And then finally, to emphasize growth and asset mindset in the syllabus. So the first thing, we're just going to do a brief overview. Um, you know, in the, in the past, we've offered entire workshops on universal design for learning, and it's really too much to cover just um, in this workshop if we're going to get to, to other things that have to do with accessible syllabi. Um, but this is the, the basic um, three for universal design for learning, or UDL. The why of learning, the what of learning, and the how of learning. So the why covers engagement for purposeful, motivated learners. We want to stimulate their interest. We want to motivate their learning. Um, the what of learning is representation for resourceful, knowledgeable learners. We want to present information and context in different ways. So different ways of providing information. And then the how of learning, action and expression. For strategic, goal-directed learners, we want to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. So giving them multiple ways, in other words, to demonstrate their learning. So um, UDL covers the design of the instruction. Um, and the goal is that the design instruction is usable by all students without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Um, so universal design principles can be applied to the overall design of instruction as well as to specific instructional materials, facilities, and strategies like lectures, classroom discussions, group work, web-based instruction, labs, field work, demonstrations, and so on. Universally designed curriculum provides students with a wide range of abilities, disabilities, ethnic backgrounds, language skills, learning styles. Um, it, it gives everyone multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. And if you want to learn more about um, Universal Design for Learning, I will post it's cast.org. I'll post that into the chat here for those of you um, who are in the session today. But the goal of Universal Design for Learning um, essentially is to design our courses um, and our instruction in such a way that, you know, if we do get a student um, who needs an accommodation because they have a disability, for example, um, we don't need to change anything because we already have built that into our, our course design. Um, so, you know, we might need to make any if at all, accommodations. Our, our course design is going to benefit all. Uh, just a little bit of information on the origins of UDL. Um, it provides a framework to create and implement lessons with flexible goals, methods, materials, and assessments that support learning for all students. And learning happens in an interaction between an individual and the environment or the transaction between those things. Um, so for that reason, it's, it's important to understand how a person's knowledge shifts and changes as they interact with the environment. Um, a single class might include students who struggle to learn for any number of reasons. And those could include things like learning disabilities or sensory and physical disabilities or English language barriers, cultural barriers or customs, um, emotional or behavioral issues. Um, or even limited access to or experience with using technology. Um, so universally designed curriculum provides for learners with this wide range of abilities, ages, disabilities, ethnic backgrounds, language skills, experiences, and learning styles. So we're thinking about all of these things as we're designing our curriculum. So what does that have to do with the syllabus? Um, why is it important? And I'm going to share another another link there um, for how UDL specifically ties into our creation of a syllabus. So often our syllabus gives students a first impression about what to expect from the upcoming learning environment in our class for the semester. It's also an opportunity for each instructor to set your class climate, to identify your specific learning expectations, and then also to discuss options and accessibility. So here is the UDL connection. Um, so within the affective network, we'll start at the, the last one here, um, providing multiple means of engagement. So we, for a syllabus, how that might look, we might outline the learning goals and objectives for the course. 
um, we might communicate to our students the relevance of the content, for example, the relevance to either their future careers or their other studies um, or you know, their lives outside of school. Um, and then also we wanna point out any opportunities for student choice within the course. So how can we provide our students with maybe some choices and how they engage with um, our course material? Uh, moving to the middle here, strategic network. This is providing multiple means of action and expression. So how this connects to the syllabus is we could use the syllabus to communicate regular routines to establish expectations for our students. Um, we would outline the timing and the format of our assessments. And we would also offer some resources for the management of information. And then finally, recognition network. This provides multiple means of representation. So we want to, in our syllabus, be explicit about the ways in which students can access our course content. So um, for example, we have a textbook. Is it a printed textbook? Is there an online option? Um, you know, how much does that textbook cost? Um, is there you know, an open version of that textbook, OER? Um, do we have slides? Are we gonna share those, those PowerPoint slides or presentation slides with our students? Um, do we have a course website? Are we using Blackboard? Um, where do they find things there? Um, are you going to be using you know, any videos? What are the requirements for them to be able to view those things? Um, and where can they find background information and examples? Um, and we want to provide multiple examples for students of the things that are expected of them. All right, so let's talk about um, accessibility next. Um, and we have uh, many resources statements that address students with differing needs. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act statement is one that is required, um, but the NIU is a welcoming place or we, we strive to be a welcoming place for all students. Um, and we are committed to providing a range of specific student needs and accommodations. Uh, so US Department of Education and Higher Learning Commission requires that all courses have a syllabus that is made available to each student enrolled in the course by the first class meeting. At a minimum regarding students' accommodations, all syllabi, at least on our campus at NIU, has to include an Americans with Disabilities statement um, with the ADA statement, you can also add a statement that requests that students with disabilities contact you re regarding accommodation needs um, and pointing them to the Disability Resource Center so that they can get those official accommodations. Um, but there's other ways that NIU accommodates its students. So we've got some, some other statements listed here other than the required one. You could include a statement uh, that says something about how student success is important to you um, and that any student who has any circumstance that may have some impact on their work in the class and for which they might require special accommodations outside of you know, official accommodations from the DRC um, to contact you early in the semester so that you can talk about those accommodations in a timely manner. So here are, and I'll post these to the chat as well, links to these uh, statements. Um, but here are just some statements that you could include uh, that address students with differing needs. So again, I mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act statement, um, producing, developing, and maintaining, producing, developing, maintaining, and using technology, the bystander intervention statement, counseling and consultation services, um, information on the Disability Resource Center and the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center, um, our non-discrimination policy, and also information for the Trauma service, Services Clinic. We also have um, some other statements for our syllabi. These are published in the faculty toolkit, and I'll give you that um, link as well. Um, but these are some other statements to consider including on your course syllabus. Um, so this, uh, the NIU Office for Academic Diversity, Equity and Inclusion established this online faculty toolkit for our NIU faculty um, and teaching assistants as well, um, where you'll find just a range of general and inclusive statements recommended that we include on our course syllabi. Um, and then pointing students to these, like 
reading them out loud to students, um, making sure that you emphasize these to students is also important so that they actually know that they're there. Because if they don't know they're in your syllabus, then they're not really doing what they're needed to do. Um, the toolkit also provides resources to navigate classroom dynamics and create culturally responsive teaching. So those are a couple of other things that you might want to take a look at for yourself. Um, these aren't required to be included in your course syllabus, only the ADA statement is, um, but these kinds of statements can help provide a dynamic educational experience that expands the understanding of differences of cultures um, and identities and respects that rich and diverse cultural representation that we have on our campus. Um, so some of the statements that we have, we have an accessibility statement, we have a multilingual student statement, a name and pronoun statement, student sexual misconduct policy, undocumented students. Um, we have the diversity, equity, and inclusion faculty toolkit. Um, there is also a new statement as of this semester on mental health and well-being. So make sure that you check that as that out as well. That's under the general statements. Um, and then also low-cost course materials commitment statement. So if you are um, participating in that low cost course materials um, initiative that we have going on at NIU, um, you can include a, a commitment to that in your syllabus so that you can draw your students' attention to that, as well as showing them you know, that you're aware of the high cost of course materials and that you're trying to ameliorate that. All right, so let's take a look at the toolkit just briefly. Stop sharing this and start sharing that. Just so I can show you how to navigate this a little bit. Um, so this is what our syllabus toolkit looks like. We've got the accessible syllabus guide here, the course guide, a workload estimator. That's a um, good thing for us to use as we're considering assignments or um, homework for students or, or major projects to kind of estimate how much time that's going to take them so we can be transparent with our students, but also so that we can be aware for ourselves of how much we're expecting students um, to do for our class, really, um, and whether that's reasonable. Um, there's a syllabus checklist too. syllabus statements are here, learner a guide on learner centered syllabi, and then success guides here. So I'll just take you to the accessible syllabus guide briefly um, just to show you what's in here. Um, so we've got information on headings and we'll talk about some of these things, but if you need you know, visuals and after the fact, um, then you can look here. And they, this is also downloadable. So you can download a guide to create an accessible syllabus in Word. Um, and ironically, it's a PDF file. Um, so headings, are important uh, information on lists, tables, links, images, columns. Um, also, an, another link to the accessibility statement, um, how you can check your accessibility in Microsoft Word, um, PDF conversion, what are some of the things that we need to be careful with with PDF conversion, um, and what are some of the accessibility issues with that. Um, and then some more resources at the bottom of the page too. And then the course syllabus guide talks about creating a student-centered syllabus. Um, the course workload estimator, so you know what that looks like. You can put in your class duration, reading assignments, writing assignments, videos, discussion posts, exams, and other assignments, and it'll tell you um, you know, what your workload estimates are. And then there's a whole learner-centered syllabus guide here, a syllabus checklist. So do we have all the information that we need to have on our syllabus? And then here are our syllabus statements that I was telling you about. Um, so we've got our general statements here, new health and well-being statement, um, 
our inclusion statements and statements specifically related to online or hybrid courses are here as well. And if you have any questions about any of these, you can contact us in CIDL um, and we can work with you one-on-one -on -one with this as well. All right. All right, so let's talk about making our syllabi accessible. Um, first of all, what is accessibility? Accessibility just basically means making sure that your content is available to as many people as possible, but especially those individuals with hearing, visual, um, or cognitive impairments who often use assistive technologies, such as screen readers. Beginning in uh, January 18, 2018, NIU implemented a policy for producing, developing, maintaining, and using technology. And I'll share that policy with you in the chat. And I will also send these links um, to you after our workshop today in a follow-up email. Um, but for this policy, all electronic and information technology has to be accessible to people with visual or hearing disabilities or who can't use a mouse or a keyboard. Uh, this applies to everything from online course materials to videos shown in class or assigned to be viewed outside of class to web applications like MyNIU, to copiers, to printers, all of the, those things. Um, even if you haven't had a student who um, is blind or, or has low vision or is hard of hearing or is deaf in one of your classes, now is the time to make all of our course materials accessible so that we don't have that kind of scramble if we do get that accom um, accommodation letter. The DRC can work with you. Um, they can help you with captioning videos, with creating accessible documents. You can also um, contact CITL if you have um, questions too, um, but definitely the DRC is a great resource for that. Um, just be cognizant of when you're contacting them right before the semester is about to start or right at the beginning of the semester um, is going to be a really busy time for them so you might want to to plan that out accordingly and work maybe in chunks so you don't have to make everything accessible all at once you can kind of space that out a little bit um, so there's a couple of tools that you can use to check the accessibility of your syllabus once you've done the work um, to, to make them accessible. There's accessibility checker, there's a quick check and a full check in Adobe Acrobat X Pro, which is available to you on your, um, you can have that installed and I'll, I'll share that link with you. Um, you can have that installed on your campus computer or laptop. Um, so you can use that for PDFs to figure out whether PDF files are accessible and to work to make them more accessible. Um, and then there's also the accessibility checker utility in Microsoft Word, which I showed you before. So those are just a couple of outside um, resources that you can use. Um, you can also, of course, use Blackboard Ally. So these are some resources that you can use outside of Blackboard before you've uploaded those documents. And then Blackboard Ally is a great resource once you you think you've got those documents good and then you can upload them and then check their accessibility even further and get some help with um, making them even more accessible through Blackboard Ally. So here are just a few quick tips for accessibility in documents such as your syllabus. And this applies to all documents that you share with students. Um, but today we're talking about the syllabus specifically, and this will help set the tone for your entire class and show your students um, that you know, accessibility is important to you. Um, so alt text. You want to add alternative text to all images, pictures, clip art, charts, tables, shapes, embedded objects, video, audio files. This alternative text is going to provide your students with an audible description of a non-text object. So when an individual using a screen reader hovers over that image with their cursor, they're going to get some information about what's in that image. Um, 
In most programs, you can right click on an object and select format to enter alternative text. Sometimes you might press like F1 or help to find out how to enter alternative text depending on what program, what word processing program or PDF um, program you're using. Um, another tip for accessibility is to use styles. They're called styles in Microsoft Word. Um, so we want to use the program's built-in or custom style menus to create titles, headings, lists, and normal paragraphs. Um, and whenever possible, we want to use heading styles in numerical order. So level one comes first before, you know, heading level two. Um, when creating lists, we want to use only round bullets. Um, very few of the fancier kind of bullets are recognizable and read by screen readers. So keep things simple um, with that for accessibility. Um, and for we we want to use the program, our word processing programs built in or custom style menus um, because just making something bold or just making some changing the font is not going to make that a heading style um, that's readable by a screen reader, for example, or that's recognizable. Um, so it doesn't have the same function. So when you're doing that, when you're just changing the, the font, um, rather than using the program program's built-in uh, style menu to make that into a heading, um, you're designing for someone who has vision. Um, because you're thinking about how it looks rather than how it functions. So we want to use the, the, the built-in or custom style menus. Um, <clears throat> we also need table header rows. So um, make sure that if including tables, we want to specify the column header rows and tables. Um, design your tables with as simple of a structure of rows and columns as possible and specify which row is your column header or row title in the table settings. Um, and then that will make it more accessible for someone who's using a screen reader, for example, to know that that is the column header. Um, also, div links are important. We want to use meaningful hyperlinks. Um, so, and this is going to be different depending on whether, so I have two separate documents generally if I'm teaching a face-to-face -face class I have. My document, you know, if you print out your syllabus, then you need to be aware that those links need to actually be the hyperlink text, um, not a descriptive link. Um, if it's a printed copy, because I say you can't click a link on a printed copy, but for electronic copies, share with your students of your syllabus, you want to have descriptive links. Um, so we don't want to use, you know, a sentence with the word here, for example, as a hyperlink. Um, so to apply, click here. We want to use a hyperlink that describes the item, like, you know, to apply, go to the fillable college application, and then fillable college application or college application would be the link. Um, so we want to use descriptive links that, you know, as we're, as our students are reading, for example, using a screen reader, screen reader, it'll read the description. So college application rather than reading out the entire URL, which it will do if you, you know, use the URL there as students listening on a screen reading device, it'll say HTTP colon slash slash, you know, so we want to be aware of that. Um, we also want to avoid using blank cells for formatting or paragraph marks for spacing between lines or paragraphs. So if you use blank cells in a spreadsheet um, or formatting marks in a Word document, we actually are creating a stuttering sound on the screen reader that can become annoying or distracting for our listeners, for our students. Um, so it's better to use um, cell padding or cell spacing and paragraph and line spacing when creating documents. So, for example, we don't want to like leave a space between uh, paragraphs. Um, we want to increase the spacing between the paragraphs. So we don't want a blank line or a blank cell because then that's going to stutter by using a screen reader. Um, captioning videos and audio, I already mentioned this, but we want to always include closed captions for all audio files. Um, it's a 
So accessibility in this way is important to individuals with low or no hearing as it is for people with sight challenges. So we want to include closed captioning for all audio files in a document or a presentation. And that includes, you know, if you're including a YouTube video um, or a video from the web that you're sharing with your students, um, we also want that to be accessible too. So make sure that your the video files that you're sharing with students um, are also including the, the captioning. Um, and trans Description is also um, a good thing to have. I try to, for my students, have them listen to podcasts um, or, or engage with podcasts. Um, and so I always make sure that there's um, a transcript available for the podcasts that they're that they're engaging with. Um, but ideally, there would be for video files, especially there would be closed captioning, um, audio files. Not not as necessary because there isn't a video and audio component that's synchronizing. Um, but for video, if we want our students to have an equitable experience um, or an accessible experience, we want them to be able to see um, or to to yeah to see that the the video the 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 visual, but also see where the audio fits into that. So that's why captioning is important. Um, but for you know something that's audio only, you know a transcript might work just as well. Um, utilize with accessibility check tools. Um, they're in newer versions of most programs. Um, so I mentioned a couple of them for Adobe Acrobat X and for Microsoft Word. Um, you can also obviously use Blackboard Ally as a great tool for that. Um, and then of course, you can always contact the DRC and, and ask them about accessibility. And then finally, add a space um, at the start of each document with an accessibility disclaimer. This tells readers who and where to call for assistance with the document or presentation if they should have difficulty reading or understanding it. So should they contact you? Um, you know, if they need accommodations, who should they contact? You know, you can you can include that information there. Um, you can include that information just generally in your syllabus as well. All right, so we often think about um, accessibility as accommodating students with disabilities, um, but there are some additional accessibility considerations that we may not necessarily consider immediately when we think about accessibility. So one of those is designing for the ease of finding information. Um, we want our students to be able to find information easily within our her syllabus. Um, that's one reason headings are so useful, especially if they're opening it in Microsoft Word. Um, you can look at uh, a list of the headings and they are accessible um, in, a, in a whole list on the left side. So if you look at the navig open up the navigation pane, you can show your students how to do this. I do this with my students, you know, show them on the first day of class. Here's how you open up the navigation pane in Microsoft Word, and then you can click on one of the headings within that navigation pane, and it'll take you to that part of your syllabus. I also organize my syllabus other than just kind of the general information about the course, which I include on the first page or two. Um, but the rest of the information in my syllabus, I put in alphabetical order so that students can find it more easily. So make sure that you're designing your syllabus for ease of finding information and not in a way that you think the information maybe should be prioritized. I used to do it on a prioritization. Um, but how can students who don't know the priorities, how can students find information easily? So in the middle of the semester, it's been months or weeks since their, your students have um, seen the syllabus maybe, and they have a question and they want to find information on that syllabus, how can you make it the easiest to find that information in your syllabus? So just think about that. And that might be different for, for each of us. Um, we also want uh, to emphasize growth and asset mindsets within our syllabi. Um, so a growth mindset conveys to students that their instructor, their faculty member believes that they can grow their abilities if they put the in the time and effort 
that you can use success strategies, that they can reach out for help when they're struggling. And then similar but different is an asset mindset, which sees all students as capable of learning while still having high expectations. And using students to help them succeed with challenging curriculum. So for asset mindset to work, we need to get to know our students well enough that we can help students see their own strengths and existing knowledge. Um, so an asset mindset, in other words, is, is looking at your students and what they bring with them as strengths, embracing those strengths and experiences, and then helping students move forward with high expectations. Um, some of us, you know, or maybe in our past, we've had deficit mindset or a fixed mindset, um, and maybe our students have a deficit or a fixed mindset. Um, and so we want to try to, to counteract those. The deficit mindset is focusing on what the students lack. So in other words, we're looking at their weaknesses and not what they have to offer. And then a fixed mindset, as opposed to a growth mindset, is believing that intelligence and ability are innate and cannot be changed. So syllabi can utilize fixed mindset messaging to convey that some students can do it, some can't, and there isn't much that can be done to change that. Uh, but that's not what we want to do. Um, that type of message disproportionately affects structurally and historically marginalized students. Um, so we want to have that asset mindset and that growth mindset conveyed to our students through the tone um, and the content of our syllabus so that they know from the beginning of the semester, this class is a class that may be difficult, it may be very challenging, but you can do it with effort and, you know, with my help, you can get through this class and, and succeed. So um, just kind of expanding on that, we want to be intentional about the tone in our syllabi. First, we want to communicate respect for our students. Students, particularly from historically marginalized groups, might question whether faculty are going to treat them fairly in interactions or in grading or in evaluation. So policies that communicate that respect and care for students can lessen the social identity threat for these students. Um, and that's where, you know, some of those inclusive statements that I talked about before can come in. Um, also, take the diversity and complexity of students' lives into account when crafting your syllabus. When policies assume that all students share the same identities or lived experiences, students from underrepresented groups can feel that they're not seen or valued in that learning environment. So by acknowledging diverse student experiences in our course policies and integrating flexibility into our course policies that provide for reasonable accommodations to meet the needs of various student circumstances, you're going to show your students that they're valued in your classroom. Some ways, specific ways to be intentional about tone in your syllabus include expressing through the syllabus tone and how you speak to students in your syllabus that you're approachable and that you want to help them succeed. Um, communicating that you care about students as people and learners, conveying to students that they, they actually do belong in your course and, you know, in your field, uh, if you're, you're teaching more upper level courses, uh, valuing the wealth of students' diversity of experience and perspectives, normalizing that students will face challenges in your course and in general, and also normalizing seeking support and utilizing resources that are available to them to help students overcome those challenges. Um, so sometimes, you know, students, particularly first generation students might feel, well, I don't wanna take advantage of these resources that are out there because that's gonna ask me. That's gonna show that I don't belong. Um, so normalizing that, okay, everyone is gonna face challenges in this course and in general, and everyone should help you know, seek so that support and utilize those resources that are available. Um, but that doesn't out you as not belonging, that that's what people who belong do um, and that people that are successful do is they, they use those resources uh, to overcome their challenges. And then finally, avoiding a laundry list. I know I've been guilty of this in the past too, but this laundry list of blaming statements or should not based on our past students' behavior. And I, you know, I've as I said, I've been guilty of this before, and I've painstakingly taken these kinds of things out of my syllabus. Um, so, for example, not giving your current students the benefit of the doubt um, and not don't admonish them for prior students perceived transgressions. Um, so I'm sure, you know, for some of you, it, it might be sound familiar, but, you know, I've done the thing where 
oh, my students did this this semester. I got to put that in my syllabus so that my students next semester don't do that. Um, but really what that's doing is just kind of putting the responsibility for previous students transgressions or perceived transgressions um, onto our current student and telling them, well, I expect you're going to do the same thing, so don't do it, um, rather than giving them the benefit of the doubt and treating them, you know, with a clean slate. Um, another way that we can, and sorry, the, the safety part got cut off here when it um, converted <laughs> my PowerPoint, but so another way that we can make our syllabi inclusive is by promoting identity safety. Um, in an identity safe classroom, students from diverse identities and backgrounds feel welcome, they feel valued, respected, and as though they're recognized as having the potential to succeed and they're less likely to experience social identity threat. And, and social identity threat is the concern that they'll be viewed in terms of negative stereotypes rather than their identity as an individual. Um, social identity threat can be provoked by subtle or overt messages about who is likely to be successful or by the lack of peers or instructors or discipline professionals that share a student's group memberships. Experiencing identity threat as a result of being negatively stereotyped, uh, underestimated based on group identity or being subjected to a hostile racial climate undermines our academic retention and achievement and it lowers a sense of social belonging that's necessary for student success. But on the other hand, identity safe classrooms that communicate that all students are valued, respected, and capable of success improve student learning and foster student engagement. Um, so a few strategies that will help you promote this idea of identity safety in your classes include establishing norms for course conducts that include reinforcement of civil and respectful communication. And these are things that you can include in your syllabus as you know the expectations for our class, um, acknowledging and valuing the diverse identities of your students, providing information on historical and social contexts that have systemically marginalized student groups to shine a light on barriers to success that are the student's fault. Um, and then using inclusive teaching practices regularly and reinforcing inclusive climate messages throughout the semester. So we don't want to just include these messages in our syllabus. That's a great first place to start um, to make our, our class more accessible and inclusive to all students, uh, students with all identities. But we also want to make sure that we're reinforcing that throughout the semester in our classes. Um, some pitfalls that we want to avoid when we're promoting identity safety include inadvertently creating an unsafe environment by promoting unconstrained freedom of expression. So freedom of expression, very important in, in higher education um, and in a liberal education, but unconstrained freedom of expression might lead us to creating an unsafe environment um, depending on the expressions that are made in our classes. Um, also, mistaking a, creating a safe environment with creating an environment in which students are always comfortable. Students should be challenged. They should engage in self-reflection. That might make them uncomfortable at times. Um, so students, for example, might become aware of, of under, unearned privileges and advantages. Um, so there are times that our students will be uncomfortable or should be uncomfortable in our class. And there are times and, and reasons for which they should not be uncomfortable. Um, so we need to recognize the difference between those two things. Um, we also want to avoid overcorrecting. Um, so for example, if I realize that I call in one type of student mostly, and then, oh, I recognize that, okay, now I need to overcorrect and never call on that type of student. That's not what we want to do. We just want to be equitable. Also, placing the burden on students from historically marginalized groups to speak or their groups is a pitfall that we want to avoid. So we want to focus on our students as individuals rather than asking them to represent their quote unquote groups um, or their individual identities. Um, and then finally, we want to avoid not being open to criticism. If we get defensive, if students point out when our efforts at inclusion are falling short, that's not going to help us grow. So we want to listen to, acknowledge, and address concerns. And we want to solicit, solicit those concerns as well. Um, you know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong if nobody tells me what I'm doing wrong uh, or what I could be doing better. So listening to students is really important and, and making them feel safe enough that they can 
be honest with you about that. Um, another way to uh, make an accessible syllabus is to make your syllabus student-centered. Student-centered course policies promote equity in courses because they communicate respect and they consider the diversity and complexity of students' experiences. They're created in such a way that fulfilling them doesn't place an undue burden on students from any individual identity group. So developing student-centered course policies is one of the most effective things we can do to promote equity and accessibility in our courses. Um, so we wanna make sure that our course policies and practices acknowledge and accommodate the lived experiences of diverse student populations. That can help us close outcome gaps by helping to ensure that students' engagement and performance isn't negatively impacted by lack of access to resources or support that's gonna help them succeed, even when their life circumstances might present obstacles to their education. Um, course policies that acknowledge students' lived experiences and are written to work for all students also help to promote student engagement in courses. It lowers identity threat, which we talked about. Um, it promotes student engagement and it increases a sense of social belonging, particularly among underrepresented or underserved student groups. So to make our syllabi more student center, um, there are a few steps we can, we can take. We can identify which student groups are on campus. Um, our classes are gonna likely or hopefully reflect the broader campus community. So we want to know who's in that community. We wanna review our course policies through the lens of each of those student groups to make sure that we're not inadvertently disadvantaging or burdening students from historically marginalized groups, including students with disabilities. Um, and if you have any trouble with this, have a few students or other faculty take a look at your syllabus to see where there might be issues. Um, another step we can take is to omit policies that are inequitable or add policies that address unmet needs of student groups. So for example, if we have students who are caregivers, um, carers, how might you craft course policies that help them succeed despite those caregiving challenges? Um, and then finally, we wanna compose policies with which students can actually comply. So in an ideal world, all students would be able to submit their work on time every time, but in the real world, life circumstances and challenges happen. So how can we craft a late work policy that actually works for students and for us? So there are some, um, some common concerns and questions regarding student-centered course policies. And these are questions and concerns that I've received before. One big question is whether student-centered policies sacrifice quote unquote rigor in our courses or don't hold students accountable. And when we're considering that question, I think we need to identify what, what is our real goal for course assignments and policies? Is it to hold students to some arbitrary standard of behavior or is it to accurately assess students' learning and mastery of course concepts? Ideally, it would be the latter. Um, and then we also need to, to think about what do we mean by rigor? By rigor, do we mean challenging course content or do we mean challenging course logistics? Um, and then regarding accountability, student-centered policies aren't designed to let students off the hook, but rather to provide a reasonable measure of flexibility so that students can reach their potential and so that their academic success isn't undermined by obstacles outside of their control. So basically, we're providing grace for students. We're not changing our expectations for the quality of their work or our grading standards. We're just trying to remove barriers to student success that are, are predicated on students' life circumstances. Um, and by removing those barriers, we actually get a more accurate picture of student learning when we employ student-centered course policies, because it's really based on whether they're meeting those objectives rather than what their life circumstances are and what their challenges are outside the classroom that might be impacting their uh, ability to meet those, those requirements um, that we may arbitrarily be enforcing through our, our course syllabi. Another question that I got um, is that student-centered policies are just a free-for-all. So in other words, that they're letting students get away with something or pull one over on it. Um, ultimately, student-centered policies are not a free-for-all. This obviously is how in how you implement it. There are limits, um, for example, curbing how many late submissions students can turn in. Um, so we're introducing some flexibility to account for life circumstances but we're not introducing so much flexibility that we spend more time chasing down students' 
missing work than actually teaching or grading or doing all of those things. Um, and then another question is whether student-centered policies promote cheating. That's another concern that I've heard. Um, and actually, student-centered policies might help reduce cheating um, because students generally resort to cheating for a few different reasons. Um, they're afraid of failing. They feel pressure to do well. They don't understand the assignment. So if we have student-centered policies in our course syllabi that provide students with opportunities to and, and the means to ask questions or to give them more time to seek help or just when they're feeling overwhelmed, they may be less tempted to, to cheat. And then finally, um, a big concern that I've heard multiple times when discussing course policies with faculty is that we need to teach students professional skills and that student-centered policies conflict with that. So for example, um, a common refrain is, you know, professors might be worried about offering extensions on ex assignments or accepting late work because in the quote real world, when students are working, they'll be required to adhere to deadlines. Uh, first of all, we're not in the working world right now. We're in, in, in a learning environment. And so students need to learn things um, and we need to adjust for that. But in, also in reality, in the real world, employees can ask for extensions in a professional environment. Managers are receptive to those requests within reason. Um, that's borne out by research. In addition, there are other skills that we're helping students develop when we have student-centered course policies. Resilience, self-advocacy, effective communication, time management, and all of those things um, can be promoted within a student-centered uh, course policy in our syllabus. All right, so we're coming up on the end of our hour here, but um, if you have any questions specifically, you can post in the chat or you can use your microphone. Um, any questions about anything that you know I've included here or any specific resources that you'd like me to find for you um, or in more information that you'd like to give me in my, that I, you'd like me to give you in my follow-up email, um, please feel free to post that to the chat or you can just unmute yourself as well. Okay, if you have any questions, please stick around. Um, otherwise, you can expect to hear from me later today with a follow up email if you're attending this uh, workshop live um, with uh, some of these resources. Um, oh, Jenny, uh, so thank you for the specific example explaining why undocumented parts. Thank you. Um, so, whether we have a template, I will check on that, Christina, and I will. If we have a, a template with the headings and everything already set for formatting, I will send that to you. I want to say yes, but let me double check on that and I will send that in my follow up email if we do. Otherwise, I'll, I'll see if I can find um, if anybody else has one of those outside of an IU. All right, so thank you so much. Again, if you have questions, just let me know um, if you think of anything after today's workshop. Um, you can always send me an email, um, amanda.smothers at niu.edu, uh, or you can contact CIDL just in general, um, and anyone who's available would be happy to help you with any of your accessible syllabus needs um, or any teaching or um, instructional technology needs. Um, so thank you so much for attending today's workshop, and I hope you all have a great start to the semester, and good luck on creating your accessible syllabi.